the FIA World Rally Championship and the Swedish International Rally. This is the only true snow rally of the year, although global warming in the last few years means that for 2001, the event moves further north in search of the white stuff. Amazingly, this is the fastest rally of the year. Amazing, because it's run on forest tracks, slick with ice and lined with rock-hard snowbanks. This is a pure driver's event, and only the bravest succeed. Back again is local hero Stig Blomqvist. No non-Scandinavian has ever won the event, but Blomqvist has won seven times. Last year, Marcus Grunholm won his first ever World Rally in Sweden. Within nine months, he was world champion. To the surprise, he loves the event. Marcus Grunholm came to Sweden desperate for points in Monte Carlo. He ground to a halt with water pump failure. In fact, all three Peugeots went out of Monte Carlo. Didier Oriol lost a wheel after hitting a rock, but for Sweden, the French have signed up Harry Robin Pera. He looked more than a little nervous. Tommy Mackinnon came to Sweden looking to repeat his win from Monte Carlo a few weeks ago. So, we, we try to do what we can. It is uh, definitely difficult to win the game this year. Marcus, example, Marcus last year was very good, fast. I'm sure he will be, he will be again. In the fray for his local rally, Mitsubishi brought in snow expert Thomas Bradstrom and his glamorous co-driver, Tina Ton. Third in Sweden last year and second back in 1992, Colin McRae needs to score here. In Monte Carlo, he lost the lead to four-time champion Tommy Mackinnon on the last day when his throttle broke. McRae was furious. Monte Carlo wasn't a complete disaster for Ford. Carlos Sainz came in second. In Sweden, the Spaniard wants to go one better. For sure, it's it's one of the toughest events. Conditions, it is always very important, and also the tires, it is crucial in this rally. Peter Solberg lives just across the border in Norway, but for Sweden, he'd be on a tight rein. After throwing away a podium place in Monte Carlo, he was ordered just to get the car home in Scandinavia. In fact, Monte Carlo saw all three Subarus go out. Marco Martin didn't even make stage one, and Richard Burns also had electrical failure. So after round one, Mackinnon has a useful four-point lead from the Fords of Sainz and Delacour. Schwartz was overjoyed to pick up three points. Then Tony Gardemeister and Freddie Lawrence. This rally is one of the most specialised events of the year. 380 kilometres of snow and ice stages. The opening day is based at Torsby, six stages in total. Day two, and the rally moves east to Graniusburg, six more stages. And the final day at Hagsport, five fast and furious stages. But day one is the leg that drivers fear most. The longest day of the rally, six stages altogether, totaling 148 kilometres. First off the ramp at the snowy start in Karlstad, the championship leader Tommy Mackinnon. After four years with a number one on his car, it's still strange to see him carrying number seven. And the man who's inherited the number one, fellow Finn, Marcus Grunholm. The Swedes love rallying and they love a hero and the flamboyant flying Scott Colin McRae is a big favorite in Sweden. With dawn on day one came a thick coat of snow and bright sunshine, perfect for fans and drivers. Stage one, 20 kilometers through the forest south of Torsby. First into battle, Tommy Mackinnon in the evergreen Mitsubishi Lancer. But running first on the road was far from ideal for the Finn. Despite the long studs on his skinny tires, the snow stopped the spikes from gripping the ice below. But Marcus Grunholm chose the longest spikes on offer from Michelin, and they dug deep into the tundra. Grunholm was fastest, a second a kilometre quicker than Mackinnon, even if the whiteout conditions made it hard to spot the road from the trees. Good, 
nyppysidos 7, toista nyppysidos 7 ja vasen eri sisältä. Teammate Didier Oriol was dragged out of his sick bed to make the start. I, I have a flu, but a little bit fever. It's a little bit better than yesterday. Rallying looked like the last thing on his wish list, but he managed eighth fastest time and a tonic for the trooper, if ever there was one. Raikkonen tried every trick in the book, but he struggled all the way through stage one. By the end of it, he was only 14th fastest, but he wasn't worried. His plan was to finish day one low enough down the order to not suffer from opening the road on day two. You don't have to be a Scandinavian to go well in Sweden, although it helps. Britain's two rally stars, Richard Burns and Colin McRae, love the snow. On stage one, Burns was second quickest in the still new Subaru, but he complained about lack of grip. McRae was just half a second slower than Burns in the Ford Focus. First time out on Pirelli snow tyres, and he was happy. Thomas Randstrom was nominated for manufacturer's point scoring in Sweden. You put the pressure on. Stage one, and he was egged on by his co-driver, Tina Turner. Not the singer, but the world's top woman navigator. This was the first time Radstrom had driven the Mitsubishi in anger, and he was fourth fastest. Robin Perra jumped into the deep end as well. He was sixth quickest, despite a major problem with his brakes. At every corner, he pumped the brake pedal like fury, desperately trying to get the brakes to bite. It left his heart in his mouth fears of crashing the half a million dollar car filling his head. Francois Delacour took third in Monte Carlo on his first outing in the Ford Focus. Sweden, though, started disastrously. He lost valuable seconds after running over a huge rock. No damage was done, except to his rhythm. If anything, the temperature was dropping, but there was fire in Alistair McRae's belly. In the last outing for the first Hyundai Accent, the Scot was 13th fastest on stage one, and only two seconds slower than his teammate, Kenneth Erickson, three times a winner on his local round. There was no chance to change tyres before stages two and three, and Mackinnon feared that he'd lose time on those two stages as well. But he came out of it better than he thought, finishing in the top six. Carlos Sainz failed to shine on stages one, and on stage two he was even slower, only 10th overall. But by stage three, the double world champion had found some speed. He couldn't explain why, but he was second fastest, and that put him in third overall. From the onboard camera, he'd also found some grip. Francois Delacour's morning was going from bad to worse. He was 14th fastest only on stage two, but like his teammate Sites, stage three suited the number three Ford driver much better. Now all three Fords were setting top six times. The tight and twisty stages were far from ideal for the big Skoda Octavia. Bruno Thierry was 14th overall after stage two, but by stage three, Armin Schwartz had started setting competitive times.
popping and banging through the forest. Belgian Freddie Lights was way off the pace. His confidence cannot have been helped by the fact that Thomas Bradstrom had been drafted in to score manufacturer's points. In Monte Carlo, the world champion Marcus Grunholt failed to make it past stage three. Maybe the Finn should have had his fingers crossed as he started stages two and three in Sweden. Halfway through stage two, the thermometer on Grunholm's dashboard started to climb and steam started to pour from the air vents. He made it to the end of stage two and topped up the water. But halfway through stage three, it was all over. Marcus, a great disappointment for you out of your second rally of the year. What happened? Yeah, it was exactly the same as in Monte Carlo. I think the feeling was the same on the stage when we had started to have the problems. It was overheating and misting up the windscreen. <laughs> Do you think it was a water pump again then? I think so, yes, but uh, we have to come back with the car. But uh, I was uh, driving now a little bit longer with the engine, so it's uh, completely destroyed. Richard Burns attacked stage two hard. Grunholm had already opened a four second lead and the Englishman was keen not to let Flat the fin out of his sights. 100 long Barreling break, into a fast left-hander, Burns lost control, control of his Subaru. Narrows. Get out, get out. The car was beached get out, like a whale help. on a yeah. snowbank. Come on! Burns was in the middle the of the shovel. stage and there were get just the five shovel. spectators to help shovel move the, back the stricken Subaru. Come on! <laughs> looking at me! Two minutes later, next through is Colin McRae. <laughs> and still the Subaru is stuck fast. <laughs> Eventually, 13 minutes lost, Burns breaks free. Not surprisingly, full of aggression, he sets the fastest time on stage three. Uh, on, the, on the second stage, I just braked too late for a junction in a very tight corner, and um, I, couldn't, I knew I couldn't get around the corner. I, I went, got turned in, hit the bank uh, on the outside, and, but just went straight through the bank and um, got stuck. There was only a few people there, four or five people, but. They did everything they could to, to help us out, but it took 13 minutes. Colin McRae was on the verge of taking the lead on stage three, but for the second time in two stages, the Swedish snowbanks claimed a British victim. McRae was luckier than Burns. A large crowd of Swedes helped McRae and his co-driver Nicky Grist heave their Ford Focus out of the ditch. But again, the clock was ticking. The car was still in the ditch as Harry Robin Perez steamed past. Into left over crest and the window broke off, the bumper lost, six but Ray right. finally got going. He'd lost five and a half Into. minutes and any hope of a podium place. He was stuck in the snow, similar to Richard and Marcus Grunholm. The cars in front have been hitting the snow banks a lot. Uh, when we came, we hit it, but it's, it gave way uh, and we just we got sort of bellied out on top of it. With his team leader out and Didier Oriol suffering flu, Harry Robin Perez suddenly found himself as Peugeot's best hope in Sweden. After stage three, he was second. Just two and a half seconds behind the darling of the Swedish forest, Thomas Bradstrom. Just three stages in the Mitsubishi and the Harry Potter lookalike and the rally world in his hands. Thomas, leading the rally after three stages, it's been a good morning for you. Yes, I mean, if you look at the times, of course it's feels quite good, it's a little bit difficult in some places. So after stage three, Radstrom leading from Rob and Perra, first time in their cars for both. Sites, Marco Martin, Tommy Mackinnon and Kenneth Erickson. Carlos Sites couldn't believe his luck as he started stage four. Grunholm was out and both Burns and McRae had lost time. The Spaniards smelt a chance to make rally history and win in Sweden. <laughs> Stage four, he was third fastest behind Burns and McRae and moved to within three and a half seconds of the leader Bradstrom.
frustrating, Colin McRae was fastest on stage four at almost 50 kilometers the longest of the day. For a man determined not to be leading at the end of the day, Tommy Mackinnon played the part well. He was seventh fastest on stage four and a comfortable fourth quickest overall. Mackinnon blamed it on more loose snow, but the Iceman was cool. Harry Rovan Perra had his early brake problem fixed at the service before stage four, but he seemed to go faster without brakes. He was fifth on stage four, and for the second time in four hours, ripped the rear bumper off his car. Radstrom was a second faster than Robin Perra over the 49.36 kilometers. The icier conditions didn't seem to suit him so well, but his lead was intact, and for that he was grateful. It was the first time that the same driver had held the lead for two stages in a row. Like Robin Perra, Sainz had also lost his rear bumper. Petter Solberg failed to shine on stages just a few kilometers from his native Norway. Closer to home was Kenneth Eriksson. He set sixth fastest time on stage four and moved to fifth overall. Burning up from a fever and numb from the flu, Didier Oriol found a cure in going fast. By the end of stage four, he was sick. Freddie Lloyd tried every trick in the rally driver's handbook to keep up with the rest, but nothing seemed to work. For the third time in three stages, there was a rally car stuck in the snow. Hyundai was sounding like Didier Oriol's sinuses. A broken exhaust manifold robbed the Scott of power and valuable places. Finally, Freddie Lights got going again. This time, he lost over three minutes. Compounding Alistair McRae's throaty exhaust, a visit into the scenery. Marco Martin in the Subaru also went up on stage four, losing his fourth place. But back in the service area, all eyes were on Tommy Mackinnon. Yeah, it is. It's been it's been all right. No no problems. A little bit difficult to be in first car. It is uh, here and there a little bit snow, and I have to clean the road. It is. It makes makes it a little bit not so not so good in in everywhere. But. Uh, I think um, I think we can do it well. I'm I'm not so worried about it at the moment. So after stage four, Radstrom leading from Sainz, Robin Perra, Mackinnon, Ericsson, and poor old Didier Oriol. Even by mid-afternoon, the temperature was still a frigid minus five. Stages five and six were as icy as the surface of the frozen lake at Torsby. But even if he wanted to regain some lost time on the last two stages, Tommy Mackinnon seemed incapable. He was still acting as pathfinder for the rest of the field, except for the fin, a path was covered in snow. Ninth on stage five and eighth on stage six put him down at fifth at the end of the day. On the way up, as Mackinnon was on the way down, was Carlos Sainz. He barged past Radstrom to take a one-second lead after stage five. But on stage six, he extended it to a comfortable 13 seconds. But the armchair experts wondered if Sainz was wise to push for the lead. Surely for day two, he would suffer as Mackinnon had for day one. <laughs> Burns was still.
from his crash earlier in the day, but at least his kicks were directed at the accelerator. Burns was second fastest on both stages five and six. Crashing had the same effect on Colin McRae, but he knew that at least he had a slim chance of a point if he pushed hard enough, so he did. Stage wins on five and six took his tally at the end of the day to three in a row. This was McRae at his absolute best, back to the wall and fighting for a point, but in his mind, he must have wondered, could he have won this rally? Six right line and six left. One seventy. Six left line is over crest line. One seventy. Here's six left right and over crest and slow four left. Skoda were a little disappointed not to be closer to the action. Armin Schwartz, though, ended day one in tenth. <laughs> surprised but pleased to be sick was Swede Kenneth Eriksson in the Hyundai. Oriol's battle with his rivals, the elements and the flu was rewarded with fourth at the end of the day. But Peugeot had a new star in their midst. Harry Brofenpera ended stage five, three seconds behind Radstrom in third. By the end of stage six, he was second. Fans egging him on, Thomas Radstrom was trying his best, but 7th on stage 5 and 10th on stage 6, plus Radstrom 2nd place. For a change, running lower down the order actually cost him time. Darkness was falling fast, and Radstrom had to drive in much darker conditions. From the onboard, you can see how hard it is to spot the changes in service on the road. Naturally, Radstrom erred on the side of caution. Back at Torsby, Carlos Sainz rolled into service, the overnight leader. So after day one, Sainz leads by 13 seconds from Robin Perra. Radstrom slips back to third, then Oriol, Mackinnon and Kenneth Eriksson. Just outside the points, Delacour, Solberg, Gardemeister and Armin Schwartz completing the top 12. Well, everything went fine. No real problem. The car is working well. Tires are working OK and just try to, to keep pushing as hard as possible. It hasn't been easy to be second in the road. I guess for Tommy it hasn't been even... It has been even more difficult to be first car, but, uh, well... Uh, that's it. Harry, you overtook Thomas on the last stage to go second overall today. It's been a good day for you. Uh, that is a very, very good day, of course. It's a first, first rally and first day for me with Peso, and, and uh, that is a fantastic day. Well, I have tried to try to be on a high level, but not doing, tried to do any mistake and so on. And I think I learned almost in every corner something about this car and that stuff. Uh, I think for me today the, the more difficult was the two first stage. I was a little bit slow in my mind and it was difficult and after that, okay, I am, I don't feel 100 but after that I, I have really no problem in the stage, just between the stage and the road section. Last two stages is in the late afternoon we had some difficulties. I think we chose a little bit wrong tyre and uh, it was no grip at all. Before day two, the rally moved east to six more stages in the mining area around Graniersburg, including the 34km stage at Fredericksburg. It's 10 o'clock in the morning and still the thermometer reads minus 21. That doesn't keep the fans from flocking to the forests. 
as leader from day one, Carlos Sainz is first into Cullen. This is the first test of his strategy. He could have dropped time last night, hoping that the cars in front would clean the road for him. But instead, he opted to keep the lead he chiseled out on day one. The gamble seems to work, if only just. There's been no snow for 36 hours, and the stage has only a sugary sprinkling of snow. Sainz lost four seconds of his lead on stage seven, but on stage eight, he was only 11th quickest and was now just three tenths of a second ahead of Robert Perra. But Robert Perra was flying and the fans were fanatical. Sixth fastest on the opening stage, put him second overall now. Just one kilometre into Cullen and Thomas Radstrom almost threw away his third place. The Swede slid wide into a snowbank. But he was a lucky boy, he powered over the bank. The price though, five seconds lost and a slide towards Tommy Mackinnon. Radstrom was not about to let Sainz and Robin Perra have all the fun though. He was a third of a second faster than Robin Perra on stage eight and was now just ten seconds behind the fin in third. On day one, Didier Oriol had fought the flu and he'd won, but on day two, it came back even stronger. Two slow times on stages seven and eight dropped Oriol back out of the points. Tommy Mackinnon dropped back deliberately on day one to get a cleaner run for day two, but the advantage was negligible on stage seven. He was third quickest and moved to fourth overall, but it was hardly a charge. On stage eight though, he was now second fastest and moved to within two seconds of Radstrom's third place. With Colin McRae out of contention, Francois Delacour was given a better choice of Pirelli's and used them wisely. Fifth quickest on stage seven and seventh quickest on stage eight. He was now fifth. Stage seven spelt the end of the rally for Alistair McRae in the higher dive. Yeah, Mark, McRae pulled over and out, but it was not all bad news. Okay, we dropped some time yesterday with a, with a problem, but apart from that, the stage times have been good. Uh, we've been fairly competitive here, Kenneth's going well. Uh, we're, we were close to Kenneth in his home rally in Sweden, so for me, I'm happy with the stage times, but okay, the result's a bit disappointing. Next through was elder brother Colin, who set fastest times on the last three stages of day one, and he woke up for day two in the same mood. Seven seconds the Ford was faster over the 26 kilometres than anyone else. For the fifth stage in a row, he was fastest. Tony Gardemeister scored points in his debut aboard a privateer Peugeot in Monte Carlo, and after stage eight in Sweden, he was ninth. Armin Schwartz was on the charge into the top ten, but it soon went pear-shaped. We just uh, try to push this morning a little bit harder. We uh, trust, yeah, we thought we can get some places back, and uh, I felt quite confident. And this was one of this corner where the snowbank was a little bit soft, and we went in with the back, and then it pulled us in, and that's it. So we stopped here. So in the first two stages, the leaderboard compressed. Carlos Sainz still leading, but just from Harry Robin Perra, Thomas Rydstrom third, Mackinnon fourth. Rock music and rallying, two things the Swedes do well, but Spain's Carlos Sainz had little to sing about. The snow lying on stage nine continued to make his dance through the forests look less than flowing. But there was another problem, rattling around under the pedals was a spare part. And a hair
pin, it jammed itself under the pedals and made Sykes stall his Ford. With the time lost, went his lead. Sykes was now fourth. Body work hanging off. Robert Perra was the one who benefited from Sykes' woes. He was now leading. Guided by his long-term co-driver, Risto Peterlinen, Robert Perra knew that keeping his nerves in check was as important as keeping the car on the road. Bradstrom had no idea that Sykes had slipped back past him into fourth, but it wouldn't have made much difference. The Swede was still kicking himself for losing five seconds earlier on. Tommy Mackinnon was third quickest on stage nine and moved to second, just eight seconds behind Robin Perra. Mackinnon hit a slow bank on stage 10 and lost second place, but ended up only two seconds behind Radstrom. Delacour called it the French Championship. In a domestic battle, he was just ahead of Oriel. Petto was going better on day two. Solberg was up to eighth after stage 10. As on day one, on day two, Kenneth Eriksson seemed to go quicker in the afternoon. He regained his points place in sixth. Daniel Carlson was the surprise Swede of the day. He set sixth fastest time on stage 10 in only his second drive in a World Rally car. Seven out of seven, and Colin McRae was on course for Richard Burns' record last year of eight stage wins in a row. And Burns was second fastest through Silkersburg, but try as he may, he made no impression on the top 15. But he and Robert Reed were tweaking their notes for 2002. As the cars returned to the service at Graniersburg, Rob and Perra started to panic. His gearbox was playing up. It was only 20 minutes to fix the problem. The pressure was building. A rerun of one of the morning stages. Stage 11 had been swept clean of snow, leaving little chance for it to slow the leading cars. Rob and Perra got a new gearbox and it instilled some confidence in the leader. He was second fastest. Mackinnon was quickest on stage 11, even though he nearly went off, but he was back in second. The day's final stage was a short spectator special near Falun. The fireworks might have been a bit premature, but Rob and Perra rose to the moment and set fast his time. Yes, I'm very happy and, and, and tomorrow everybody asks about the start, in, start place and uh, we we'll see today what happened with uh, Carlos, and... but anyway, that is very difficult, every choice. It was a good day. Two times, two stages, uh, stage before, uh, stage number 10, I made one mistake, and uh, we hit the snowbank, and uh, that's why we lost a little bit. Last stage also, we went off, and uh, was uh, we lost a uh, few seconds for that. The leaderboard had been a yo-yo all day, but Rob and Perra led from Mackinnon, Radstrom and Sykes. Delacour and Oriel still in that French battle. Just outside the point, Peter Solberg and Tony Gardermeister close at it. And Colin McRae up to 11. Up to 10 centimetres of snow fell overnight and the five stages round Hagforce, including two to be run twice, suddenly made the end of the rally look anything but predictable. Smiles or grimaces, it was so cold it was hard to tell as they limbered up for the final rounds of this three-way fight. The scrap had already taken its toll, the cuts and scrapes on the cars told the story of a 48-hour battle. But with snow falling, this was going to be as much about tyres as technique. 
in this climax to the fastest, most furious rally of the year. Nothing was left to chance. Arch enemies behind the wheel, but close friends for the rest of the time. Rob and Perra tells Mackinnon, even if I beat you, I'll still like you. The battle line is drawn. First out of the trap, Harry, Rob and Perra. At each corner, four Michelin ice tyres with good long spikes for puncturing through the snow to the ice below. Rob and Perra knew that if he as much as flinched, friend or not, Mackinnon would trample him underfoot. But Robert Perra's no rookie. He might not have won a world rally, but he knows his stuff. He attacked Sagan like his life depended on it. He was second quickest. On stage 14, Rob and Perra again hoped his car wasn't cleaning the road too much for the cars behind. He could feel his Peugeot fighting for grip. Fourth was the best he could manage. Next up, the Michael Schumacher of rallying, Tommy Mackinnon. Like Rob and Perra, he too had Michelins on his wheels, but the studs on his were shorter, too short in fact. As quickly as Rob and Perra cleared a line, it was covered over again by the snow. Mackinnon was fighting a losing battle. On stage 13 and then on stage 14, he felt any chance of catching his friend slip slide away. Two stages, Mackinnon had lost 10 seconds. Thomas Radstrom knew that he was never going to be allowed to pass his team leader whilst Mackinnon was still on four wheels, but Sykes was not far off his rear bumper and he had to keep pushing. For 13 and 14, Radstrom had also gone for shorter studs. On board, you could hear the wheels scrabbling for grip. Radstrom dug deep into his years of snow rally to try and keep El Matador from catching him. Sykes had prayed for snow and now he was getting it. It was his only chance of catching the cars in front. But on 13, Robert Perra went three seconds faster. The script had been thrown out of the window. On 14, Sykes tried again. Like a shark smells blood, he closed in on his prey. He was now just 5.8 seconds behind Bradstrom for third. With the leaders almost tripping over each other, Richard Burns took advantage and set fastest times on 13 and 14. So Rob and Perra came out of 14 with a 17 second lead from Mackinnon, then Bradstrom, Sainz, Francois Delacour, and Didier Oriol in sixth. It was worth standing around for the final three stages of the rally. Anything could still happen. Harry, Rob and Perra might have had the edge on the first two stages of the day, but there were still 50 stage kilometres before the end, and the conditions were still changeable. Rob and Perra eased off a little, but he was horrified to find out he was only 12th fastest. Tommy Mackinnon left the service area at Hank Force with steam coming out of his ears. His parting words were maximum attack. But when he found out his best was not good enough, the steam reappeared. He was sick and was beginning to run out of ideas. Thomas Radstrom was struggling like Mackinnon. He expected to lose third to sight by the end of the stage. But as the Spaniard reached the end of the stage, the times were close. But Radstrom had escaped this time by two seconds. With every stage, Didier Oriol knew he was closer to getting back into his sickness. Except in the middle of Sagan, Oriol's transmission gave way, putting the Frenchman out of the rally and out of his misery. 
Marcus Ericsson had been in the top five earlier in the rally, but a series of problems dropped him to ninth by the end of stage 15. Colin McRae was now using a manual gear change after problems earlier in the morning. On Sagan, he was third fastest and had Ericsson in his sights. The manufacturer's point was now looking a possibility. After sticking his head above the parapet a few times, on stage 15, Marco Martin was second quickest. Determined not to throw away his first rally win on the penultimate stage, Harry Rotham Era moved on to stage 16. Like Sagan, this was the second time through Raman for the drivers. With nerves as icy as the Swedish stages, Robert Pera drove the stage from the textbook. He braked early, but not too early. He slid wide, but not too wide. Mackin has decided it was better to fight for first, than roll over and accept second. His windows steaming up with adrenaline, he took his Mitsubishi to the limit and beyond. But it was not enough. Robert Pera was four seconds faster. His lead now 18.6 seconds. Transmission problem from stage 16 cost Francois Delacour dearly. He was only 15th fastest, and even with Didier Auriel gone, his fifth place looked far from safe. With Delacour slowing, Petter Solberg now had a chance at a points finish. After Raman, he was seventh, but both Delacour and Tony Gardermeister were less than nine seconds ahead. But pushing hard on ice comes loaded with danger. Solberg was lucky to survive that moment. Not only did he nearly crash, his tyres suffered from the speed. In one stage to run, he would have to find some extra speed and grip. With one service to go, one stage to go, Harry Robin Perra's nerves were beginning to fray. Harry, do you think you're going to do it? Uh, we try the best and doing the safety in the last stages. We'll see. We try to push what we can, but uh, Harry, Harry has done so great drive in the morning. All, sta all, all four stages, he's, he has done incredible performance. What about the last stage, flat out? Yes, of course, we will try. I mean, we have been pushing quite hard already today, so I think we will try to push as hard as we can and stay on the road. Colin, you said you were going to push hard. You've got that manufacturer's point. Eight seconds behind Ericsson. Do you think you can get two? Yeah, it's possible. If we keep on going the way we've been going, then it should be possible. So with one stage to go, Robin Perra, 18.6 seconds from Mackinnon. Radstrom still third, but Sykes close behind him and Gardermeister close to Delacour. The snowy scene was set to the grand finale to the Swedish rally. 21 kilometers from his first rally win, Harry Rovenpera's heart was thumping like a boy on his first date. His lead might look comfortable, but he knew that Tommy Mackinnon wouldn't slow down until the last corner of the last stage. Sure enough, Mackinac was braced for war. He fitted snow tyres, he tightened his straps a little tighter, and Risto Madison Becky called the notes a little faster. The second a kilometre Mackinac needed to beat his friend. But a quarter of a way into the stage, Mackinnon threw it all away. Second place, let alone a win, lay buried in the Christmas trees. Again, we see it. Mackinnon starts to lose the back of the Mitsubishi. Frantically, he overcorrects, but the car's like a pendulum and it snaps right into the trees. Game over. Risto Manison Mackey gives the thumbs up as Thomas Radstrom passes the sunken Mitsubishi. But there's little reason to give the thumbs up. Mackinnon and Manison Mackey are okay, but their car is a wreck. Another two minutes and Carlos Sainz spots the red. Lewis Moyer thinks it's Radstrom.
which was some kind of snow tire, which was perfect tire for this condition, and I thought I have a still little chance because Harry went in front, uh, front he went with ice tire. I thought I have a still little chance to to do something, and I was pushing very very hard. Unfortunately, this right corner it was just. Uh, snap over still quickly and it was so fast I it was no power enough to pull front back on the road and the, the snow bank get through and, and rolled over. Yeah. You must be very disappointed. Of course it is. We lost good second place at least we lost with them. So it's rallying. I try to do what I could do. But uh, so sometimes it happens. Yeah. His team leader out, it was now up to Thomas Radstrom to attack. But the gap to Rovan Perra was 25 seconds. And with Mackin and out, Francois Delacour now had a chance to score, but his gearbox was playing up. Wondering what could have been, Mackinnon trudged home. Mackinnon's woes gave Peter Solberg sink in the Subaru. With Delacour struggling, Tony Gardemeister let up into four. Meanwhile, up ahead, Robert Perra was nearing the finish. <laughs> Heading for seventh, Sweden's new hero, Daniel Carlsen. And in all the drama, Kenneth Eriksson finished second on the stage and eighth overall in the last event for the original Hyundai Accent. Ericsson managed to hold off Colin McRae thanks to a worsening problem with the Scots gear change. He was stuck in sick and not happy. But at least McRae's top 10 finish gave Ford some manufacturer's points. Bruno Thierry snuck into the top 10 at the end of a hard rally for the Czech team. Mackin and out, the rounds were pushing hard, Rob and Perra dared not smile as he rolled to the end of the final stage. We're back in the service area, the Peugeot team waited by their radio. And the news over the airwaves was good, Rob and Perra had won the Swedish rally. I'm very happy. Of course. Oh. Thomas Radstrom must have sensed as he rolled to the finish that first had eluded him. But he and Tina Turner were delighted. Not half as delighted as Harry Robert Perra. 12 years since he drove his first rally, and he finally won a world rally. How does it feel? You've won the Swedish rally. <laughs> that is fantastic feeling. It's the uh, first time with the uh, best, best, best team and uh, best result. But, but I never did you, can. Did, did you hear that Tommy had gone off during the rally? Yes, I, I heard that. But that is very sad because that is always sad. It was very, very difficult to drive. I mean, in some places you have very, very good grip and then you thought you can go and the next moment it was like an uh, ice hockey rink. So it was very difficult. Six points uh, for the manufacturers, four points for the drivers, and that put us on, on, on the lead of the drivers, and, well, it's not too bad. I saw Tommy outside the road, and I didn't want to take any chances. If I did any, something stupid, for example, like Tommy did, it's, I would have been from Subaru, so... <laughs> We lost less than a half a second kilometre, which is absolutely incredible performance of the car as well. And we have a new car coming, so I think very soon we will be up fighting for the podium position on our own speed, so it's very promising. This is our little diamond. No, I can kiss you. We did it too, Mas was driving brilliant. I, I am just happy to have such a good driver. and. He was keeping it steady and he felt that I was nervous. But after I've seen Tom, I said, Thomas, please, please, now, you know? And he said, it's okay, it's okay. And, and it was really, I'm really happy. So confirmation then that Harry Robin Perez won his first world rally. Radstrom second and Sykes third. Peter Solberg edges into sixth at the bottom. 
just out of the points, but a great drive for Daniel Carlson. Colin McRae there, ninth, and Marco Martin, 12th. Three drivers now level at the top of the Drivers' Championship, but Harry Robin Perra wasn't nominated for points for Peugeot, so they score nothing here. Mitsubishi leading in the manufacturers from Ford. Last year it was Marcus Gurenholm who won his first World Rally in Sweden. This year it's Harry Robin Perra. Will his career now match that of his compatriot? Goodbye from Scandinavia.